Hi folks, uh, this lecture is about uh, international political economy. Now, international political economy uh, is a very broad area uh, of, of inquiry. It's really the um, politics of economics. Uh, and because because it comes under international relations rather than politics. So it's dealing with the international politics of trade and, and the international politics of economics. And so under, under that, uh, uh, you have the international monetary system, the currency exchange system, and the trade system. So you'd, you'd uh, you know, for example, the, the World Trade Organization is, is, um, is uh, central to all those sort of um, uh, systems. You you then, but you also have an intersection of the politics of trade within countries determines their foreign policy or their their trade policies, um, uh, plus the economics within states affects the economics globally. Uh, you also have international finance uh, and, and under international political economy, there's also um, what's known as development studies. Right? So looking at the different, not, not just purely the economics, though there is a lot of that, but sort of overlaying the, um, the politics of those decisions. Right? Uh, so today, I'm not going to cover all of these. I'll, I'll just briefly mention a few of them, um, but I've decided to uh, to narrow it down to to give you um, a lecture on development studies uh, because I think that might be uh, of the most interest out of these uh, out of all these fields um, uh, for for you. Okay, so uh, the the international uh, currency and exchange system was built uh, at the Bretton Woods um, Conference uh, in 1946, so uh, immediately after um, World War Two. And here, GATT, which then became the World Trade Organization, and the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. And the uh, um, the the system of the U.S. currency being backed by gold uh, and, and that whole financial um, uh, infrastructure was built at uh, the Bretton Woods Conference, and and I'm assuming that that's all been uh, well covered in uh, previous. Uh, subjects in this master's degree, uh, sorry, in this degree. So, so I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to spend uh, any time on that. Okay. Uh, now you have um, under international political economy, you you have a lot of um, study about the politics of tariffs and trade. Um, uh, um, looking at how countries uh, make decisions about what is going to be their uh, be their trade system their tariff system how open or closed they're going to be etc so and all of those sort of politics of tariffs kind of um, uh, theories can really be split into two so either uh, like on the left, you have a society-centered um, set of theories, or you can have a state-centered uh, set of theories. And so the society-focused theories assumptions are that trade policy is decided by a balance of power of interest groups within each state. And two, any tariff or subsidy will be bad for the overall social welfare of the state. So it's going to make virtually everyone poorer. And so you have um, uh, um, 
interest groups within states battling over uh, getting higher or lower subsidies for you know for various industries and then you have state centered uh, focused assumptions where states can act independently of interest group pressures and number two the second assumption is that under certain circumstances protection protectionism can increase the overall state's uh, social welfare right. so i'll just briefly have a look at um uh, at them so starting with the society uh, centered um, uh, theories the, the first one the first major one is the is factor competition theory and this argues that international trade splits along class lines uh, so within so trade policy is uh, is a competition or is a struggle between uh, uh, classes so so rich and poor really right so uh, uh, capitalists and and uh, and the workers uh, though it does assume that labor and capital are completely mobile right uh, which is not really a, a correct assumption but uh, factor competition theory splits splits the fight along class lines whereas sector competition theory uh, argues that that international trade policy there's the struggle is between industries right so the, uh, in Australia <coughs> you had a uh, a struggle between a a car industry that was getting subsidies uh, and a mining industry that's getting subsidies or, or um, tax uh, you know benefits and things like that so and the they actually have different interests even though there's workers on both sides and there's um, uh, you know rich capitalist owners on both sides they actually have different uh, um, they they have different um, interests right and so it's a fight for uh, control of government policy uh, you know over over what gets tariffs and what gets subsidies and uh, and that sort of thing there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of theories in this area that uh, look at the collective action problem uh, and how it affects tariff policy so so there's really two types of of problems here uh, collective action problems the first is a simple failure to organize right uh, and the second one is wanting others to pay costs right so that's a free rider problem so this is this is especially a problem when an individual's effort will cost them something while making no real difference to the outcome um, so so voting or um, maybe uh, um, it's in everyone's interest for big companies to be taxed um, uh, you know fairly but it's only in the companies managements uh, and owners interests uh, to organize to to drive taxes down for them right so there there is a um, a collective action problem in that a lot of um, uh, a lot of lobbying within governments uh, these special interest groups are the only ones that have the organizational and the interest to organize and to lobby and and uh, push uh, leaders to to adopt policies uh, that that benefit them right so there's a collective action problem uh, in all of these there's also uh, lots of work done on how the political system uh, affects trade policy um, within and 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 uh, externally right so uh, I won't go into this but there, there's a lot of different ways even so 
uh, for democracies. There's a lot, lot of different ways of counting or uh, or determining the winner. All right, you can have a first past the post, or or just a simple majority, or um, a preferential system. All these sort of things uh, that can affect how the balance of power between interest groups within a country uh, um, comes about, you know, forms. But there's also there there is also a high correlation between um, uh, the electoral cycle and um, preferential trade policies that that help uh, the majority of people. Right? Okay, so that's a society-centred um, uh, research uh, about politics of tariffs. And the, so let's have a quick look at the um, state-centred one. So infant industry protection is, is, um, uh, is the idea that you can, you, government should choose a, a sector to protect and to help them build up, to, so subsidise them and have t high tariffs protecting their their um, uh, their domestic markets uh, and that sort of thing. Whereas um, more free trade um, um, policies would say that any tariffs or subsidies is bad for the for the overall social welfare because it makes everyone pay taxes or it makes everyone. Uh, and makes pro products that are protected more expensive uh, and probably a little less quality, and um, and so it makes ev virtually everyone except the people who own or work in that particular company or industry poorer, right? And so that whereas state-centered um, uh, theories there. There's research on can you choose an industry and protect it, and that becomes a a, uh, a you know a state champion or you know, and it's good and is it good for overall social welfare or is it just good for the people who work in that industry? So uh, and you you know research about um, whether or not um, uh, those sort of policies increase or decrease state strength. Uh, but sort of revolving around the middle of it is uh, strategic trade theory. So let's have a quick look at that. So strategic trade theory is the idea that certain special industries earn extraordinary, extraordinarily or extraordinary um, returns. Right? So not Normally, in a capitalist system, economics says that that uh, you will end up with um, competition in each each uh, industry, and that competition will drive down prices while driving up quality, uh, and and you know everyone's a winner, right? Um, and so so subsidising one company or another uh, um, uh, is is bad for virtually everyone. However, strategic trade theory points out that for certain uh, for certain industries where there is a very very high cost of entry, right? So there's so for example uh, computers or or um, airplanes or you know submarines or things like that. Um, this is these are not industries that um, you know uh, mum and dad uh, um, uh, investors can start up right they require immense amount of cutting edge research and development and technology and so and just the 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 size of the investment right is mammoth uh, and so those sort of industries like aeroplanes and nuclear power stations and um, you know things like that, uh, computer chips, they tend towards um, once a company cracks it, once a company succeeds in that area, it, they 
the the high costs of entry mean that the market really remains as a monopoly or an oligopoly and um, and so you have uh, much higher prices much higher returns because there's little competition in it and so if you take this this idea uh, and research seems to show that you know when you're on the cutting edge of technology, there does seem to be a um, much higher uh, return on investment, and that means you can pay higher wages, means you can pay higher taxes, uh, it means the uh, the entire society benefits um, if you can if you can pick a winner. Uh, and through tariffs and subsidies and, and you know research uh, help uh, get them to the cutting edge of, of a um, high barrier industry. Right? Okay, so that's a, just a really quick general overview of, um, of the financial and um, trade architecture type of intellectual uh, international political economy and the politics of, of tariffs and trades uh, um, and and uh, so now but now I want to give you a, a lecture on the different development um, strategies used by countries uh, and just uh, to explain why some com one, some countries have done extraordinarily well, uh, so, you know China and Japan and uh, you know the Southeast Asian Tigers economies, uh, they you have all done though those countries have all done extremely well uh, from trade, while other countries uh, haven't. Right? So. Um, so I'm going to focus on development studies for, for the rest of this lecture. So if we look at developing countries trade policies uh, before World War One, most developing countries had very, uh, very open trade policies uh, and export interests within their countries uh, dominated. Right? So um, so all, all the economies were quite uh, export orientated in general terms. We're going to be talking a lot in general terms uh, in this lecture. But in general terms, before World War One, reasonably open um, trade policies. Uh, um, but then in World War One, the US and the EU stopped producing consumer goods. Right? So they've, they've um, started making tanks and guns and planes and stuff, right? So that causes shortages in, uh, in developing countries. And so uh, what's called import substitution uh, starts up in quite a big way. And so there's all these shortages, all this demand uh, for, you know, fridges and um, uh, lathes and, you know, um, all all the various things that, that that countries had until then imported from uh, the European Union countries and, and the US and that all just shut off uh, quite suddenly and so uh, um, import substitution um, came to dominate um, um, a lot of developing countries trade policies but then you have a, an interwar period where uh, the demand for export goods uh, uh, fr from the US and EU falls dramatically. So around about 1929, the, uh, particularly the British, British Empire, uh, moved to erect trade barriers and to make uh, their empire compl um, completely sort of self-sufficient or, or at least um, uh, blocking out trade with uh, uh, non-member states, right? And so that was a, that was a trade shock uh, to the entire system. Right? Um, and so many developing countries' uh, exports fell dramatically. 
So then World War II, um, after, the, after the destruction of World War II, uh, you've, you've got the um, institution of uh, the Bretton Woods system, right? The Bretton, Wood, um, Bretton Woods Conference uh, at the end of World War II, where the US bribed up a, um, uh, an alliance of, um, of countries and, uh, and you had um, GATT and the WTO uh, uh, and amongst, amongst the, um, the Western countries, you, you had a series of negotiations in the WTO, particularly between the US and, and the European Union, to gradually um, uh, get rid of trade barriers. However, in the developing countries, uh, other than Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, um, you you continued to see you or you you saw a refusal to participate in GATT and and the WTO, and trade barriers remained extremely high. Uh, in uh, in one sense, to protect the the local industries that had sprung up uh, as trade substitution, um, but uh, from World War One, um, uh, lots of economies had um, had to look after their own demand, had to look after their own consumer goods, and they didn't want to compete with the bigger markets lower prices, economies of scale of the US and, and uh, European manufacturers. Plus, you've got uh, the non-aligned movement, very strong amongst all the developing countries that are trying to not get sucked into the Cold War. Right? They're trying to not take uh, sides. And uh, so, so you've uh, you've got a continuation of these really high trade barriers. Then we hit about the 1980s and especially 1991 where the communist um, system uh, planned economies uh, breaks down and is shown to be um, economically unsustainable. And then so from the late 1980s, you've got all developing countries really returning to open trade policies and joining the WTO. Um, uh, um, you know, in general terms, right? Uh, uh, and but then we have um, Latin American, American debt crisis, the um, Asian financial crisis. GFC. So this lecture is really just trying to explain why, why the developing countries tended to go through this um, this series uh, of policies, policy um, settings, uh, um, and bring brings up the speed to um, just to give a bit, a bit of background, especially to uh, the Southeast Asian. Um, uh, Indo-Pacific countries, uh, you've got this quite, in in some circumstances, quite extreme differences in economic performance. Uh, uh, and so this this lecture will uh, will give you an idea as to to why. Uh. Okay, so the uh, to understand the strategy of import substitution, uh, so uh, what's in the textbook, it's called in Import Substitution Industrialization, so ISI. And uh, so both, uh, so there's two, two theories that underpin the concept of using import substitution to industrialize. Uh, so one's structuralism theory and one's the Singer-Prebisch theory. Um, and so they sort of both 
lead into this idea of using import substitution to industrialize your country. So all three of these are driven by the two, by twin assumptions. One, that a heavy concentration on agriculture results in poverty, right? Um, all, so this, uh, um, all this talk about, uh, you, you've, you might've heard the term that um, countries are trying to move up the value chain, right? Um, and secondly, uh, higher living standards can only be achieved through industrialization. So that's the, those two two ideas really uh, um, drove this idea of uh, trying to industrialize by by blocking imports and uh, substituting your own domestic um, production for them. So structuralism theory, uh, the this is the 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 argument here is that developing economies are too inflexible to allow resources to shift to manufacturing due to two uh, key coordination problems. Right? Firstly, you've got a complementary demand problem. So a new business has no one to sell to unless there are lots of new businesses starting simultaneously to create jobs that pay cash. Right, so you can't, you, uh, Policy makers in developing countries are looking at this this complementary demand problem and seeing that there's no there's no way to get a lift off right. Um, if you had some jobs already, then you would have a have demand. People wanted to buy things or whatever. But if if everyone is at subsistence level, no one's buying TVs and fridges and cars, right? Uh, and secondly, the uh, Procunary external economies problem. So this is the argument here is that cars and steel could both lower price and increase production if they could coordinate between them, right? So, uh, so if you could, if the steel makers and the car makers could coordinate how much they're going to make of each product, then you could lower the price and increase production. Uh, um, but it requires coordination, right? which can't sort of happen in this, in a, you know, uh, when there's no, when you haven't achieved liftoff, right? So where, there, where there's no demand. So the both, so the thinking of structuralism theory is that the only way to get a, get over these problems is by a governmental big push, right? Um, uh, they they solve the coordination problems, and they solve the risk taking investment uh, problem, right? So, income elasticity uh, of demand is where. So I don't want to get too too into the weeds with the with the economic jargon, but it's it's kind of important to understand just the basics of uh, income elasticity of demand. So here, the, the quantity of a good or service changes depending on how much income you have. Right? So the, the idea here is that manufactured goods uh, on the left are income elastic in that the uh, the more money more income you have the more uh, manufactured goods you you'll buy right so uh, uh, the more income you have the more cars you buy or TVs or microwaves or you know manufactured goods uh, the saturation point of of uh, you know you've got enough is is quite high, right? And so that's why that curve uh, uh, curves upwards like that. Whereas the thinking goes is that agriculture, uh, so the second graph, the graph in the middle, is income inelastic in that uh, the the more income you have, you don't buy more food. Right, so 
there's only so much bread you can eat and so many sausages or you know steaks or whatever right so uh so the there's always a flattening of that curve right because it's because it's income inelastic it's not um, doesn't respond to income in a positive way so um the worst case so the thinking for the singer prebish theory is that uh agricultural um countries uh, countries that are, their economies are uh developing and so they're dominated by agriculture then up to a certain point uh um there it is positively associated with income but then you hit a point where it becomes negatively uh um, associated with income so uh, what this means is that the price for import and manufactured goods uh, tends to go up whereas the price of exports of um, agriculture and primary goods tends to go down because as the world gets richer as your trading partners get richer um, as as the developing world gets richer uh, the the efficiency of um, making producing agriculture means prices get cheaper and cheaper uh, and because there's just a limit to how, how much wheat someone will buy right so uh, whereas manufactured goods as everyone gets richer and as everyone uh, you know developing countries get richer then the, they will start buying uh, higher priced manufactured goods. So instead of the crappy black and white TV, they buy a, a, a nice um, you know, a Samsung uh, color TV, right? Instead of buying a, a crappy fixed up car, they buy a new car, right? So, uh, and so the idea of the Singer Prebish theory is that if you stay at an agricultural um, level and don't move up the manufactured value chain then your your exports your export income will always be facing downward pressure uh, and your while the cost demand and price of um, of imported manufactured goods will continue to rise and so countries can uh, get trapped in this uh, poverty cycle where um, the things that they're trying to make money from so agriculture uh, um, keeps earning them less and less while all the things that they want to buy to to make their lives better uh, keep getting more and more expensive so both of both the um, Singer Prebish and the um, uh, structural theories, structuralism, both say that you've got to industrialize to get uh, get wealthy. And a, a lot of the a lot of the developing world looked at during the Cold War, like looked at the Soviet seemingly uh, amazing success of turning what was uh, extremely subsistence poor um, agricultural uh, orientated economy turning it into this industrial powerhouse seemingly overnight right so from the 1930s to the 1950s uh, it seemed like the Soviets uh, w w had all the answers right and um, and it really kind of looked like the the Soviets were going to win the Cold War, right? Um, uh, so, so what this led to was firstly um, easy import substitution uh, industrialization, and then we've got a branching. There's some that went that doubled down on that that import substitution uh, industrialization or then 
but then others um, then others move to an export orientated strategy rather than an import um, substitution strategy. So we, we'll just talk a little bit about uh, each of them. So easy import substitution was uh, was for uh, relatively simple goods right, selling to the domestic market. So uh, woodwork furniture, uh, shoes, clothes, um, uh, uh, drinks, um, that sort of thing, right? So, uh, and part of the advantage of this is that it didn't require uh, upskilling your your labour force uh, much at all, right? Uh, labour intensive stuff, uh, you know, hand sewing shoes or hand carving um, uh, furniture or hand sewing uh, clothes, all, all very labour intensive, but not, um, actually I won't say not skilled, because um, I don't know if you've ever tried to hand make uh, furniture, but uh, there's a hell of a lot of skill and knowledge involved, but uh, not, not the high-end school uh, driven knowledge, right? So, um, so none of it requires, uh, you know, a master's degree or anything. So easy, e easy, uh, or first generation import substitution, uh, industrialized industrialization. The aim was to increase wage based labor. Right, so to get people off the farms and to get them into the the, the money economy, right, uh, solve unemployment and and gradually develop uh, skills, all of which worked reasonably well initially, but the gains from this strategy eventually reached a, a limit. So the the focus uh, was on relatively simple products because it was low risk, right? There's a large domestic demand currently satisfied by imports. Um, number two, they're, they're mature products. So the equipment is easily purchased secondhand from industrialized countries, right? Um, you know, bottling plants or something like that. Uh, and, or lays, things like that. So, and three, it all uses low skilled labor. So the shift into wage-based work could happen without huge investments in lifting um, education and, and skills. So once this has sort of hit its limit, though, uh, you've got this branching, this uh, differentiation between Latin America and Africa, who, who doubled down on this import substitution uh, strategy. And then you've got the East Asian model, right, the Asian tigers that switched to an export orientated strategy. So secondary import industrialization was a doubling down right so more complex goods uh, but the focus was still on on replacing uh, imports and selling only to the domestic market you had high level of government owned enterprises and high tariffs to protect those uh, those state-owned enterprises right so uh, and these high tariffs really close off the economy um, So you had um, tariff levels that completely shut off uh, countries from imports. So Mexico, Mexico and Uruguay uh, seem lower, but they actually use quotas instead. Right? So all of these countries really uh, um, are seeking to stop their markets being flooded with cheap imports by uh, raising the tariffs on them, so to making, you know, pricing them out and 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 to develop a, a domestic economy for, and trying to move up the value chain, right? So they're starting, so instead of just making clothes and, and furniture, they're starting to try and make uh, uh, industrial factory uh, machines, cars, um, you know, things like that. So, uh, 
so you can see the 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 tariffs that some of these countries have got on right so so chile's got 328 percent tariff on consumer goods right uh, so to buy a a european made uh, uh, fridge in chile uh, in you know around 1960 uh, you would be paying 328 percent tax on top of the purchase price right so that's how you protect the uh, domestic industry right so there would have been plenty there would have there would have been a a state-owned chile enterprise um or uh, or some you know some fridge manufacturer in chile uh, the problem was without competition you, there's no need to uh, to improve quality right you've got a captive market um, if it's for sort of essential goods so autarky in this way or autarky is normally spoke about speak spoke about in terms of uh, military hardware right you um, uh, you don't want your supply chain being controlled by your enemy right so that's why countries tend to try great powers anyway try and uh, achieve autarky where they're building everything for their military within their borders but that is extremely inefficient and makes everyone poorer right so um, uh, and that's what's happened with with these countries right so this doubling down on the import substitution industrialization uh, meant it sort of worked through the 60s and 70s and you had quite rapid economic growth but there were very large costs to the rest of the economy right so the non-manufacturing economy so agriculture because it was the only thing that that really uh, was making real money, right? Uh, it was taxed up to 60% by most developing countries, uh, by their governments. And, and the way they, they did this is by setting up monopoly agricultural marketing boards where you had to sell all your rice or your wheat or whatever to the, the state um, marketing board who would then sell at world prices and pay pay the farmers only 40% of what they keep what the, you know 40% of the difference so the the state is able to uh, uh, get a much higher price than what they pay the farmers so the 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 upshot of this is that you get uh, less and less investment in farming so you don't have improvements in um, efficiencies and uh, and farmers just get poorer and poorer right so secondary industrial uh, substitution produced two key imbalances right? uh, Initially, I mean, in the 60s and up to about um, the late 70s, in some countries you've got uh, six to seven, eight percent um, GDP growth, right? But by 1970, two key imbalances were, were showing. The first one was large government deficits. This is because they had state-owned enterprises uh, everywhere. You know, everything was um, to to get that lift off. You've got big state uh, investment starting up fridge companies starting up you know lathe companies starting up car companies right uh, but these state-owned firms never actually became profitable right um, especially because all their imports uh, all the inputs to uh, higher-end products tend to to be uh, imports so uh 
uh, so quite costly. Also, government subsidies on essential items, so food, water, electricity, petrol, transport, telephones, all these sort of things were, were subsidised uh, in developing countries. And quite, I mean, understandably, they're trying to make things cheaper for their for their people to to get lift off to create some demand so, um, so that people sign on you know sign on to having electricity and buy a car and you know buy a phone and uh, that sort of thing right so but all of this has to be has to be financed by debt and so the size of government increases dramatically as well right everyone's working for the government whether it's building fridges or or down coal mines or whatever the the whole economy becomes completely dominated by uh by the government government sector and the second one uh is persistent current account deficits right so uh your current account is is your um is your exports uh minus your imports right and so if you're in deficit your your exports are the money you earn for that is much less than what you're importing the money that's going out so and that's because their manufactured goods were just not competitive on the world market if you if you've got a a protected captive market at home for fridges or microwaves or something there is no incentive to invest in R&D or product development or anything. You would just keep selling the same crappy car, uh, you know, uh, to to people because you've got a 500% import tax, import tariff on on any com competitors' um, products. Also. Taxes on agriculture suppressed investment and and eventually led to output declines. Right, so the the only thing that was actually earning them foreign currency, right, the only thing that they were actually exporting, so food, uh, um, the there was declines because farmers were taxed into poverty, and certainly couldn't um, afford to expand get economies of scale hire people uh, buy you know tractors or um, harvesters or anything like that right so it all stayed um, very uh, uh, subsistence level when um, agriculture's taxed to death so uh, so that process led to um, export decline and uh, um, no, no export um, revenue right plus government set uh overvalued exchange rates right so that's that's a in an attempt to lower the cost of imports so in inputs into um their manufactured goods right uh everyone involved in that saw a benefit of a high of a high uh exchange rate so so that us goods or european goods were cost less for them right? and domestic policies made changing or domestic politics made changing uh, secondary import substitution industrialization very hard very risky politically because to tr to try and lower your your government debt the first thing you probably need to do is stop subsidizing everything right so um petrol is like a is a very commonly subsidized uh product in the developing world um but removing those subsidies makes essential things much more expensive and will be very politically damaging. Secondly, if you lower your exchange rate to help your exports, it makes 
everything more expensive because uh, all your manufactured goods still all the guts of it is usually made overseas right well, um, uh, plus ending tariff barriers if you try and lower the tariff barriers what what that does is it's it ends corruption um, or what we call rent seeking opportunities right? so if you've got high high tariff barriers you've you've got an opportunity for uh, for corruption because you've got a shortage of goods uh, uh, like self-imposed scarcity for but a high demand for for the you know um, uh, sophisticated uh, manufactured goods plus you've got people in the government that are able to get around paying the tariff right so that they can they can sell high-end goods import them sell them without putting the tariff on and still make you know make a, an absolute killing right? so not only do the people like general public don't want um, government debt to start start being reined in uh, because it'll make their essentials more expensive but it also makes all the manufactured high-end goods more expensive plus there's people in the government that are, are corrupt and and getting around the tariffs um, and that is essentially protecting their business as well plus you've got all the manufacturers that that would would have to either get dramatically better overnight or they're going to shut down and um, and unemployment's going to go up so once once they had doubled down on this for a decade decade or two it's very very hard to change direction so for example um, attempts at reform uh, met this sort of resistance quite often right so not in 1971 uh, a newly formed civilian government devalues the currency in an attempt to correct the current account deficit right um, and but then then immediately gets overthrown by a military coup which restores the overvalued exchange rate and keeps the tariffs high right because <laughs> the things that these corrupt officials want to buy um, it makes them much cheaper and it protects their income stream right? um, so lots of the African um, uh, coups military coups and takeovers were driven by this underlying um, uh, a civilian government would come in and try and fix the economy right fix the the um, current account deficit uh, and would get overthrown by a military coup that usually had the support of most of the people because they didn't understand that eventually this thing's going to explode right you can't uh, you, you can't run a developing economy by just printing money um, eventually all that money becomes worthless and, and the economy crashes so facing uh, so this this sort of process this um, second secondary import substitution lasts until about um, uh, the start of the 1980s so 1982 around there and so this this is where the, the first country to default happened and so that was Mexico Mexico uh, had had just run these trade deficits and this uh, uh, run it all on government debt um, and eventually they, they couldn't pay the interest rates the, the interest on their loans and so they defaulted and so this sets off a chain of defaults as countries can't afford to meet their repayments uh, and as interest rates go up because of because of the Mexican um, default interest rates jumped for developing countries uh, debt and uh, set off a chain reaction of countries uh, defaulting on their national debt
So uh, you can see the debt levels here uh, rising in the developing countries uh, from 1966 to uh, 1998, right? continued to climb. And so not only, um, not only was the debt getting out of control, but also even for the oil producing countries. Uh, so you had a, um, a series of shocks came in the 1970s. Between 1970 and 1973, you had uh, the oil shock created by OPEC, uh, banning uh, the US. Um, you had a recession in the US in the late 70s. You had interest rates that went up dramatically in uh, the, the early 80s. Uh, so many, many developing countries responded by this to this by just borrowing more money, <laughs> and so eventually the the um, uh, they can't repay that, and uh, you have a series of defaults. So uh, when countries couldn't afford to make their repayments. Uh, most were forced into um, going to the World Bank and the IMF uh, to restructure their loans uh, or or um, or just bail out their governments. Um, and uh, so all of these all of these countries uh, in Africa and Latin America, um, mo most of them uh, needed uh, structural adjustment policies that were uh kind of enforced by by the uh, IMF um, so all these countries had uh, major major um, current current account problems and and government debt problems uh, building up to to the 80s and 90s so the 1980s Latin and American debt crisis structural adjustment uh, so the IMF imposes uh, what was called the Washington Consensus, right? uh, so and and this was like shock therapy, extremely traumatic, very unpopular, put a lot of people uh, out of work, um, uh, and out of work in countries where that means you starve, right? um, uh, and lots of all the state-owned enterprises close, so no one's got a job. Um, uh, and they devalue their currency, so so everything becomes more expensive. They they uh, bring in austerity, so they cut government services, jobs, pensions, wages. Um, they eliminate subsidies for essential services, so there's no more subsidies for food or water or sewage or petrol or electricity. So all of those things go up dramatically right when your income has been cut. Uh, and it stops industrial subsidies, so firms fold because they're just not profitable. Right? Uh, the Washington Consensus also, or the neoliberal Washington uh, Structural Adjustment Plan, also had uh, a big push to privatise all the state-owned enterprises. So even, even there, you have staff cuts, wage cuts, and prices go up right, to make them to make them profitable, and you remove all trade barriers, right? So all those domestic companies that re that relied on you know 350 percent tariffs on their competitors, they all just fold, right? And they they also insisted on uh, countries removing any financial controls to 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 promote foreign direct investment, right? Because you're not going to get foreign direct investment if it means you, you know, once you put your money in, you can't get it out. But the the downside of this is that it allows capital flight from your people, and so when a, anyone with money is going to get their money out of that currency and into U.S. dollars or something, so which further devalues the the uh, the currency and can make all the banks fall over because everyone's withdrawing their cash, uh, you know, it uh, causes a whole lot of problems. So all around the developing world, through uh, through all those countries that 
had the IMF um, step in. Uh, the the IMF and the US and and uh, the Europeans all became extremely extremely unpopular. Uh, if you know, <laughs> uh, um, understandably. So what the IMF was trying to do was make Latin American economies like the East Asian economies, right? So while most of the developing world is in crisis, the East Asian currencies have a boom. Right? Initially, this is just South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, but it was also followed by Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. Uh, so the, the, the East Asian tigers uh, just boomed, right? Um, uh, and so the, the idea, of the IMF was trying to um, take that blueprint and apply it uh, to to all the um, uh, African and um, South American countries, and 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 it was extremely traumatic, right? But, um, a, a brutal reordering of of, um, of economies. So, uh, so instead of continuing with import substitution behind tariff walls, the East Asian countries had swapped over to a strategy where they concentrated on certain key export sectors and they subsidized them. Right? Brought the tariff barriers down, but subsidized uh, the development of certain key industries. Okay, so how did the, how did the East Asians do it, right? How did how did they get their economies to just take off uh, and and go from uh, poor to to rich, right? So there's two explanations. Right? The first one is the neoliberal explanation. So this is so this is the uh, IMF's understanding of of uh, of how they did it. So. Firstly, they kept their inflation really low. So from 1961 to 1991, uh, uh, compared to uh, Latin America and Africa that had 62% inflation of their currencies um, on average, uh, the Asian Tigers only had 7.6, right? which is, is very low uh, for 30 years. right? Um, uh, Australia has a 2% target, though good luck with that. Um, number two, unlike developed countries, a low inf this low inf inflation allowed undervaluation of the currency, which helped exports and limited imports, just like a tariff did, because it, it um, made Im makes imports more expensive. Right? Number three, they borrowed very little, and when they did, they borrowed domestically. Right? So they borrowed from domestic uh, banks, uh, and they, and importantly, they they borrowed in their domestic currency. Second, so that so so you couldn't so that that meant that uh, vol volatility in the uh, currency didn't affect their repayments. Low, infl low inflation also promoted a high savings rate, which kept borrowing rates uh, low, uh, which again in encouraged uh, investment. Number five, not having an overvalued currency meant trade liberalisation didn't create uh, trade deficits. Right? Um, uh, because the currency was was operating as a as a mini sort of tariff by itself, right? Whereas Latin America and Africa, if they um, uh, they liberalise their trade, uh, you know, dropping their their um, uh, tariffs, the the trade deficit would only grow right? because they'd be flooded with um, uh, with well-made imports. Right? 
And number six, an undervalued and stable exchange rate encourages private investment in export oriented firms. So that's the neoliberal explanation. That's the, the uh, Western um, economists, or at least you know, in the in the 90s kind of um, understanding of what happened. And so you can see that the IMF has gone in to try and do this. Try, uh, and especially the inflation, getting inflation down, uh, you know, that's where the shock therapy kind of um, methods uh, were thought to be necessary, right? To break that inflationary spiral. Um, uh, get prices going down rather than up, um, but very, very brutal, and I think wrong. So this is the East Asian model explanation. Um, this is what the governments in these countries thought they were doing. Uh, so in in the East Asian countries thought they were doing. So development is thought of as happening in stages. Each stage of government is is intervention uh, in at each stage government intervention is aimed at identifying and promoting industries that are likely to be profitable against international competition right like that's the key it's still export focused the focus is is export into international markets rather than selling to their own domestic market so the first stage Tariffs and subsidies are used to promote low-skill, labour-intensive industry, and there's, there, there tends to be very high investment into um, uh, primary and secondary education to lift the uh, lift the labour force skills. Uh, so, so reasonably long term, right? You don't you don't get that payoff for 15 years. Um, then the second stage, tariffs and subsidies used to promote heavy industries, uh, especially things like steel, shipbuilding, chemicals, um, and plastics. These sort of key industrial products um, uh, uh, are, are used to lift the rest of the economy's um, skill levels, uh, um, it takes a lot of skill to build a ship, but um, if your steel industry uh, is subsidised, protected by tariffs, you can produce a lot of steel, which makes your shipbuilding cheaper, etc. So the third stage, tariffs and subsidies are used to promote high skilled and high research and development intensive consumer and industrial products. So that's things like semiconductors, right? So chips for um, for computers, computers, telecommunications, robotics, biotechnology, you know, maybe AI, um, that sort of thing, right? So uh, all of the um, made in China 2030, 2025. Anyway, there there is probably 25 five year plans. This the thing. Uh, so all of China's um, uh, tariffs and subsidies now are, are aimed at producing these high R&D intensive uh, products. Right? So this this is what the East Asian governments thought they were doing, and I, I and what um, uh, so they're not just opening themselves up to complete domination by foreign. Um, Imports, that, but they use, but they're they're using uh, the tariffs and subsidies to protect key key industries. Right? Not every industry. They're not subsidising petrol. Right? <laughs> they're not subsidising food. They're they're subsidising um, chip makers. Right? They're subsidises subsidising aircraft manufacturers right? uh, so that they can slowly reduce those tariffs and subsidies and and have a an industry that is exporting earning um, 
foreign capital, right? US dollars mainly, uh, which is very crucial, and uh, uh, you know, creating jobs and, and a good economy. So that's actually very, very different from what the IMF um, thought. It's very, very different from the uh, what the IMF structural adjustment plans did too, right? Um, okay. So uh, Latin America has done okay. Um, Africa's done badly though. Uh, uh, this has led many to say that the neoliberal explanation was wrong and the Washington consensus on how development should be pursued uh, should be replaced by the East Asian model or or perhaps uh, it's often been called uh, the Beijing consensus right? where, where it's a very mercantile, um, it's a return to... to the mercantile system um, uh, of 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 the the interwar period and and even before that, um, uh, where you've got these empires uh, um, very focused on making sure gold is coming in quicker than it's going out. Uh, we talked about how that was the trigger for um, the opium uh, uh, wars or um, and the opium trade uh, because China was um, just producing everything cheaper, right? And so, um, so it's a real return to that sort of mercantile thinking uh, rather than the neoliberal thinking that we've had for the last thirty years, um, where. Uh, open economies are good, um, regulation or subsidies or tariffs are all bad. Right? So, uh, none has done the East Asian um, strategy better than China. Plus, it was similar to Latin America and Africa in that it transitioned from a managed economy to a more liberalised one. Uh, so, the, the difference... The difference is they had they didn't have huge debt. So China has had the advantage that other East Asian countries uh, had, where they didn't have to wind back um, uh, massive amounts of debt. At least at the start, they have a lot of debt now, and uh, a lot of their as we talked about um, previously, the, uh, all their state-owned enterprises had basically gone broke um, by, uh, by the late 1990s. Um, and so, uh, uh, and we spoke about how Japan and uh, Hong Kong um, uh, industrialists moved into um, uh, moved into China in in the early 90s and really gave the gave them gave China that lift um, and import uh, uh, um, income while the Chinese government subsidized all the port building and the roads and you know that sort of thing So, will the Beijing consensus replace the Washington consensus, right? Um, and even, even now, uh, even now the, um, the idea of austerity uh, after 2008 was, um, at least in Europe, Austerity was the mantra, right? We've got to get this high debt down and things like that. Uh, but they still did these massive, massive stimuluses, right? So, in fact, the, the, the number one thing they, they told Asian countries not to do, or, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yes, Asian and, and African and Latin American countries to, to not do, like, They've got to stop printing money. They've got to stop um, subsidising industries. Uh, 
uh, or bailing them out or anything like that, right? Um, that is exactly what the US and Europe have done. Right? <laughs> They've bailed all their big industries out and uh, they print a lot of money. Right? So maybe the Washington consensus, the neoliberal idea of of um, of small government uh, uh, staying out of the market, maybe that's dead. And I, and especially with the coming um, economic downturn uh, that we're going to face because of the coronavirus, it's uh, the the idea of um, of uh, bailing out the banks again and um, uh, and austerity is going to be a hard sell, all right? At least in the U in in the US, Australia um, and the UK uh, and most of Europe, I think, um, have moved to a much better model of uh, of paying companies to, so they can keep paying their their employees. That that seems to be a much much better way of doing it. Um, you're putting money into the hands of people rather than just bailing out the 1% uh, investor class that own all the banks and, and big industry. So, um, export orientation uh, is great, right? Uh, it's certainly worked for China and Japan and Korea and Taiwan and, and not to mention, uh, you know, uh, not to leave out Germany and um, even Australia and things like that. So, um, and while it's okay for a handful of small economies to use tariffs and subsidies to give their industries an advantage, right? Um, you know, but the problem comes is when every country does that, then we're actually back to just trade wars again, right? Um, and trade wars tend to lead into hot wars, right? And so there is actually a, a higher goal, a higher reason for for global cooperation in in tariff lowering uh, and and an open global economy, because it means that um, uh, you, you you don't have wars. Uh, because countries need to get their hands on scarce resources, right? Uh, but we've been moving moving towards uh, uh, tariff barriers, or, or at least uh, they're tariff barriers by by subterfuge. In that, if you have a free trade agreement with a, with country with another country. Other countries that aren't part of that free trade agreement, it, in essence, their your goods become cheaper and theirs remain expensive, right? So it's it's a tariff in reserve, uh, re reverse. We can we have seen since the uh, the late nineties that more and more economies are moving into trade blocks, and if the Chinese and US economies become more and more decoupled. Uh, that is the fear that we're, we're that we're seeing the we we are living through the last days of of uh, of globalization, and that um, that process is being thrown into reverse. So we'll see. Interesting times. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Um, just a just a little bit of background about um, the the difference between import substitution and uh, and what happened with the East Asian economies. Okay, uh, stay safe, stay well. I'll uh, see you next lecture.